Okay, thank you uh, very much to William Paul Cockshot for this interview. Uh, Paul is a honorary research fellow in computer science at Glasgow University, trained as an engineer. Um, we'll mostly be talking about the topics from this book, How the World Works, which is a uh, materialist history of human labor, also has things to say about the future. Um, one of the points that I found particularly interesting in this book was your endorsement of Marx's claim that, uh, as he puts it roughly, accumulation of capital is increase of the proletariat. Um, so there's a link between accumulation of capital and the growth of the labor force. Um, so I wonder if you could explain why you endorse this claim and why you think it implies a kind of demographic crisis for contemporary capitalism. OK. It, the, the claim stems from the labor theory of value um, that the, way, the reason why things are valuable is that human time has to be spent to produce them. And that's something that Adam Smith argued and that uh, Marx endorsed. The corollary of that is that once you take into account or discount fluctuations in the value of money, the, the flow of value generated in an economy is determined by the number of people in the economy. Now, that can be thrown off by the fact that over time, the unit of currency can inflate. The actual real expenditure that a society undertakes is the expenditure of its, its people's time. Now, when you look at what the rate of profit is, the rate of profit is basically dividing the share of national income that goes to the to property as opposed to wages by the value of the capital stock in the country now again when you've got inflation going on it's difficult to get an accurate measure of the the value of the capital stock because machines that were bought a long time ago seem cheap um, yeah. but it by modern value but what you have to do to to get realistic accounting is to say what is the replacement cost of the equipment and if the replacement cost is measured in the same units the number of people would have to work for how many years now to replace the equipment and you're rating the value of output in the person years as well so you divide both by a constant constant quantity constant scalar dimension you find that if you, you get a better understanding of what marx's theory of a declining rate of profit was about it was saying that as time went on the stock of equipment in society required more and more years to build it. it. It was an accumulated wealth of decades of labor. And if you express the rate of profit in terms of 20 years labor to build all the equipment we've got now, mm -hmm. and there's a year's national output this year, and maybe 40% of that national output ends up as property income, you get 40% over 20, which comes to quite a small number. So the issue is, if the if you want to look at what happens to the rate of profit, you have to look at how the capital stock of society changes over time, measured in constant units of, of the years it would take to replace it. Compared in current to, in, in terms current, of current yes, labor. Yeah. In current at years at current labor productivity, mm -hmm. you look at the rate of growth of the workforce. Now, if the rate of growth of the workforce 
keeps play keeps track of the rate of growth of the capital stock then the rate of profit won't change but if the, the capital stock grows faster than the workforce then the rate of profit tends to fall as capitalism has developed in particular with the development of forms of artificial birth control you've got step falls in the family sizes almost all developed capitalist countries would have negative population growth if they couldn't obtain immigration now if you've got a negative population growth there is no positive rate of profit that is stable let us assume that half of all profits are reinvested in industry and the other half are spent on luxuries mm -hmm. okay that means from that you can drive a constant flow of increase of the, the capital stock of a country per year now if 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 the if the population is fixed say 50 percent of income goes on 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 capital to, to capital and half of that is reinvested that would mean a quarter of a year's annual produce went to adding to the capital stock of the country okay and that would mean the capital stock would grow to an amount equal to a quarter of a year's annual produce if the population wasn't increasing you get an exponential decline of the profit rate towards zero but if the workforce is actually falling mm -hmm. you get an exponential decline towards a negative uh level right that is the end point that all capitalist countries are approaching all the capitalist countries which have got stagnant population growth now that's only the developed countries if you look at a country like south africa or egypt or turkey these countries have still got relatively rapid population growth mm -hmm. and under those circumstances the the rate of profit can actually be climbing because the population growth exceeds the rate at which the capital stock is being built up in those countries and and when that happens the bargaining position of workers in the labor market is poor as well and the share of national income going in wages tends to fall right what will have what happens when the um labor force is growing very slowly relative to the capital stock is that the bargaining position of labor relative to capital shifts and we're already seeing this in britain mm -hmm. since we left the eu Mm -hmm. it's now possible to have big waves of strikes of a scale which was not possible since the the same conditions existed which was largely in the 1950s and 60s when you had rapid capital stock growth relatively slow labor force growth yeah so this gets on to a point another point i wanted to ask you about i mean this is one of engel's criticisms of um the political economy of his day it's a criticism that's still made of neoclassical economics today that technology and technological progress is just taken as this exogenous variable engels describes it as the scientific invention that just kind of fall down from the sky and then the, the economic forces respond to them but of course what we need to understand is a much more integrated uh story where technological change is a function of various economic factors including the wage level um so i wondered if you could say well it's not just the wage level it it's yeah. it, you also require a state that because of the commercial position of the state um and its competition with other uh trading nations is willing to invest in scientific research um you yeah. had you had that in hellenistic times when you had 
Ptolemaic Egypt and Syracuse, for example, were both willing to invest in scientific research and set up research institutions. So you, you, you had the library at um, Alexandria and the research institutions associated with that. And in Syracuse, you, they were supporting Archimedes's research into hydrostatics. Now, why were they doing this? It was because of trade interests. They wanted to build larger ships. And you again had that between Britain and France being willing to finance research in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. That meant you had a set of preconditions which when they wanted to build machinery, they had an increased um, set of tools to draw on. Now, some of the tools that they were drawing on when they were building self-acting mules, for example, for spinning cotton in Britain, um, dated right back to Ptolemaic Egypt. The basic principle of sequencing the operations um, via a peg wheel, a wheel with um, pegs in it which sequence things. Mm -hmm. that, that's described by Hero of Alexandria. And the, that type of sequencing mechanism is is reinvented and applied to production in in the 18th century right and uh, the it was just for toys in the uh alexandrian period because they they didn't have the artificial sources of power which make it practical so your view i think is is contrary to what we typically hear in the media for the most part um, which is, you know, the, the technological change is just constantly accelerating. Labor productivity will grow in all these unpredictable ways. And your view seems to be that uh, both have slowed down considerably over the last 50 years. And maybe more interestingly, in the transition to a post fossil fuel uh, industrial base will probably slow down even more. Um, it'll, it'll slow down in important areas, certainly. Um, mm -hmm. There are some areas where it's, it's going to improve, where the areas of production which are purely information production. There's been a class of independent producers of the, the intellectual professions who've remained untouched relatively by the process which ruined handloom weavers in the 19th century. Now, with things like chat GPT and stable diffusion, crafts which have remained as independent crafts are now being subject to the dictates of machinery. And the, the, the social position of those who follow these independent crafts becomes threatened. Right. But that doesn't mean that productivity as a whole is going to rise because there's a the set of basic industries on which the economy depends um changes relatively slowly we're still using an energy production technology which was mature in the middle of the the 20th century and this dependence on it is brought starkly forward when as soon as you get a shortage of oil as soon as uh, there's any restriction on the supply of hydrocarbon fuels, the cost of living goes up. Uh, we, and if you consider what's going to happen, if you phase that out entirely, the, the rapid increase in the cost of living we've had over the last year is a small fraction of that. That's basically because it takes a hell of a lot more work to re-equip an economy with non-fossil fuel equipment. We're living on capital stock that was put in from the, in the electricity networks that were put in from the 1930s to the 1960s, really. 
And that's the, the infrastructure we're living on. Now that's inadequate to deliver enough electricity if you're going to power all the cars by electricity. Yeah. Because we have a second infrastructure, which is an infrastructure of petrol stations, an infrastructure of highways, an infrastructure of oil refineries. All those represent millions and millions of person years of effort to build. And they have to be replaced. They have to be replaced by something which isn't using fossil fuels. And that's not going to be cheap. And what it actually means is a lot more people are going to have to be working in construction. A lot more people are going to have to be working in manufacturing to build the, this infrastructure. And at the same time, if you're going to look at the steelworks, the steelworks are currently producing steel using coal. That's relatively easy. If you shift to direct hydrogen reduction of steel, you have to replace all your, your blast furnaces. You have to construct big hydrolysis, uh, hydrolysis plants to generate the hydrogen. You have to use a lot more electricity to heat the steel. The mm -hmm. process of replacement of the technologies requires considerable capital investment. That requires a, a larger share of national income going to capital investment in order to do it, which puts pressure on being able to have a higher living standard because more if effective productivity goes down because mm -hmm. you're having to put more of the, the nation's labor force into building capital equipment and less into producing goods for consumption. Right. So, you know, in a way, this brings me to the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is, I mean, to, to what extent are these kinds of uh, phenomena just features of our industrial system hitting its natural limits, its kind of internal limits? It's possible that it, they, they are. The, the, the question is, is there a different? We have a when you say what is the capitalist mode of production, the capitalist mode of production has been fossil capitalism. Right. OK, it has mm -hmm. been a mode of production based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Now. It's capable of adapting to being one based on electricity and electricity generated from other sources. The question then is. Can the development of new forms of energy occur fast enough to provide adequate energy supplies for a whole world that is shifting to industrial production? It probably can be done, but it's going to be done at, at huge expense is what I think. Yeah, huge expense, but also there's questions about the social organisation that would be required. Supposing we were able to shift to a, a planned socialist economy yeah. of the kind you've advocated for a long time, uh, how much better could we make the situation in, well, in terms of? Compare the rate of capital accumulation that, or accumulation in, in capital equipment, which has been possible in planned economies to what Britain has achieved over the last 40 years. OK, the Chinese economy, which although has a, a large market sector. Is largely a state owned capitalist economy. Yeah, has been achieving over 40 percent. Of GDP being channeled into production of new equipment and new infrastructure. The highest Britain has achieved in my lifetime is in the low 20s. And that was under the Wilson government. Who had an objective of reaching 25 percent, he never reached it. Right. Um, never reached it because they didn't have 
what what the labor politicians were saying at the time is you could take a horse to water you couldn't force it to drink when they were referring to private industry uh, mm -hmm. they were giving them the the indications on what they should invest but they you couldn't they couldn't persuade them to do it yeah the difference is that in the industries that are owned by the government the investment can be instructed and there was the british economy had no difficulty rapidly developing nuclear power in the 1950s and 60s even though no one had ever built a nuclear power station before um the the churchill government approved in about 1954 the building of a nuclear power station and within two years the queen was opening it and having it switched on mm -hmm. they could do that because it was a government department acting yeah. under orders that did it now the government department hired or was headed by you know leading physicists like cockerel people who would split the atom and it were of known competence but they could do it because the government could give instructions to do it if they had waited in the hope that the british engineering industry would sometime do it it would never have happened mm -hmm. now you're starting to see private capital investing in things like um small nuclear power stations and in possible um thermonuclear stations there's a lot of capital investment going into that that is only possible under two conditions one is that for 50 years the public sector paid for experimental in um thermonuclear tokamaks paid for the basic research and secondly that they know that there's going to be government planning mandating the replacement of fossil fuel power stations under those circumstances the the, the private capital comes forth this is the the difference between free market capitalism and the kind of um states mixed economy that britain had up until thatcher and that china's got now mm -hmm. the those kind of mixed economies can achieve a much higher rate of investment right and the capital stock rises rapidly and this then produces the the the, the stronger social position of the working class and that produces a social that produced a social crisis in britain now mm -hmm. historically that social crisis was 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 resolved by thatcherism but uh, it wasn't inevitable that that would be the case it could have yeah. been resolved by a different program that uh, tony ben and uh part of the labor party were were, were wanting one thing you could do if you moved to a planned economy where you wouldn't be uh you wouldn't have individual capitalists extracting profit in the same way in which you've discussed is you you could have a situation where labor effectively received the full value uh workers receive the full value of their labor um you then pay for an for investment out of taxation out of taxation right but in principle if you work for or an hour then you're able to net new investment would have to be met out of taxation because the, the the value of goods that people purchase would include the depreciation on them so just replacement of capital stock wouldn't have to be met out of taxation right because the depreciation would count as part of the labor embodied in yeah what yeah. they were buying right so i'm just trying to think about you know how not only the reality of work could be different in this situation but also how some of the demographic issues i mean one thing you mentioned in the book for example is uh in theory, the cost of childcare should be uh, one third uh, of the earnings of, of a parent because each uh, person in childcare centre can take care of three children. And yet, as, as it turns out, it's usually not worthwhile for somebody to. Uh, it, it's for someone on average earnings, mm -hmm. a woman on average earnings 
it's scarcely worth it at the cost of current childcare. You have to be earning above average earnings, above median earnings. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should say someone on median on a median female income, it's barely worth paying the childcare costs. Right. Yeah. And that's that's because they're only receiving maybe 50% of the labor that they 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 perform and therefore the, the the three to one ratio in the um nursery doesn't count for much right yeah it's cancelled out but the, yeah the fact that they're not receiving the full value of their labor so i mean so, so that could be different under your proposed system in which case presumably the there'd be some democratic demographic shifts i mean people yeah, i mean it it's a major problem that any modern society faces is how it can prevent demographic decline. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was not a, a problem societies faced for the same reason in the past. If a society was faced with demographic decline in the past, it was due to starvation and disease. Now it has to be in terms of making it easier and cheaper for people to, to raise children mm -hmm. because they have the choice which they didn't have in the past until about well 70 years ago once people were 14 they were out to work yeah um the expense of of supporting children for longer has risen in and in an agricultural society children are, are helping on the farm at a much earlier age than that so the, the real cost of, of raising children to support a capitalist economy is much higher because capital demands people who are highly trained. Mm -hmm. And that means the parents have got to, to support them during a much longer education process. Yeah. So So what then would be the most positive vision that you could imagine for a future economy? Well, you, you would have to go to a system where education and further education are paid for by the state and free and paid for out of general taxation. Mm -hmm. um, the, there would have to be needs-based benefits which were realistically enough to compensate for the cost of, of raising children. Now, this does mean that you general taxation has to be enough to meet that. And therefore, this this will be a big cultural issue of how much general taxation people are willing to um, endure. endure to do that. But I mean, so, so supposing you could find the right level, then you could find the right level of taxation in order to sustain a stable population you would be able to presumably direct capital investment to do whatever we needed to do to shift to, to be able to provide energy for that yeah. population and we would then what remain in a steady state in that well you would expect some continuing um technological improvements in areas which will will improve uh productivity it's difficult to predict them in the future Mm -hmm. what they're going to be they're not going to stop um but what is going to stop is the increasing physical resource consumption because that is bound to be a a constraint and right. if if you are having to recycle more materials again that is more expensive than just digging them up the old idea of socialism being based on limitless abundance is mm -hmm. is isn't practical with a world industrial population of nine billion, nine billion, sorry, billion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. What appeared plausible to people writing in the 19th century when a European population, as a total European population, might have been 150 million, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it doesn't scale to the current world population. Yeah. There's got to be resource con recycling and constraints. How do you envisage the future of work? 
under either you know an optimal scenario or i don't think it's going to go away okay mm -hmm. i don't think you can um assume that we're all going to be lazy and do nothing that there is it's still going to be necessary for people to work um you would expect the the increasing areas to be replaced by machinery but that that just means that there is always a residuum of activities which machinery can't currently be applied to and more people will be employed in whatever is the then residual sector mm -hmm. but um I, I mean i don't want to speculate on on what technologies are going to be available in 50 years time yeah no. I think an awful lot of them will be much the same, but uh, what new ones will be available? No, but I mean, should the aim be to reduce labour to the minimum necessary? Well, you you certainly want to reduce overwork, but I'm not sure that reducing it to an absolute minimum is sensible because what it gives people a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, I, and I'm not convinced how feasible it is to deal with a lot of social activities like looking after children, educating children by machines. Okay, great. I think that's uh, enough for us. So thank you very much for that.